You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode four, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Susan Mousehart, a broadcaster and communication consultant and the author of five books, including the topic of today's podcast, The Winter of Our Disconnect, How Three Totally Wired Teenagers and a Mother Who Slept With Her iPhone Pulled the Plug on Their Technology and Lived to Tell the Tale. Dr. Mousehart's books have been published in over a dozen languages. As an independent producer, her popular radio series, Multiple Choice and Story Catcher, have been heard across Australia on ABC Radio and across the world on iTunes and the web. She has appeared as a commentator on the Today Show, Late Line, CNN, Fox and & Friends, and in publications ranging from Family Circle and Parents to the Huffington Post and The Guardian. Susan's lifestyle column in the Weekend Australian magazine ran weekly for a legendary 12 years, and she has lectured in media at NYU, Fordham, and Curtin University of Technology. We are extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Susan Mousehart to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, Susan, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, Robert. We're going to talk about your book, The Winter of Our Disconnect, How Three Totally Wired Teenagers and a Mother Who Slept With Her iPhone Pulled the Plug on Their Technology and Lived to Tell the Tale, which is your very personal account of how you and your three teenage children at the time banished the use of smartphones, laptops, uh, and other modern technology from your home for a full six months from January through July of 2009. I'm curious to start out with what was it that motivated you to, to launch what you ended up, and you and your family ended up just calling The Experiment? Right. Well, my motivation was what they call overdetermined. So there were so many factors that uh, had been inspiring me to give this a try, probably dating back to, you know, the first time I read Thoreau's Walden when I was 21 or 22 and became intrigued um, with the compelling idea that one should live consciously. And, you know, Thoreau was grumpy about the post office as a new technology. <laughs> And I always, I'm, I'm not a Luddite, I actually really love technology, but that idea of paring life down to its essentials always had a lot of appeal for me. I have a PhD in a field of study called media ecology, which looks at the way our, our technology, our media and our symbol systems create environments uh, if, in which we make meaning. So I, you know, kind of know a lot and have a very raised consciousness about the impact of media of all kinds on the way human beings interact, on the, you know, the values that we have on our cognitive habits of mind, um, you know, just about every aspect of our lives is um, in some way influenced by the media environment that we inhabit. So, so there was that, and then there was the fact that in the intervening years since getting that PhD, when I was, you know, young and childless, <laughs> acquiring three children mm -hmm. and and doing so at a point in our sort of socio-technological history when we'd moved into a digital age, and so when I was sort of doing my study, it, television was the medium that people were talking about and questioning and maybe nervous about. But um, that had been well and truly overtaken by 2009 by the digital world that my children were inhabiting. So even as quite young teenagers, you know, their lives were increasingly uh, bound up. And this will come as no surprise to anybody in 2017. But in, you know, in 2009, it was sort of MySpace and, um, you know, eBay was new and YouTube and, you know, so this business of migrating to a screen uh, was was brand new and my kids enthusiastically jumped on board. Yeah, it really struck me reading that, as you said, you're not a Luddite. You seemed like, a, a as a writer, a pretty heavy technology user. Uh, I think the iPhone was only about a year old uh, when 
when you embarked on the experiment and you seemed like you were a pretty heavy iPhone user and your kids were in their teens, right? 14 through 18 at the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Like, and I was, you know, putting the emphasis on my kids and their heavy technology use. Look, I was the leader of the band. Um, mm -hmm. I am a, a nerd. I, I love gadgets. I love sort of problem solving technologically. And so I was completely on board in, in Australia. I was, you know, a very early adopter of the iPhone and it changed my life. And I grasped immediately as I did actually the first time I stumbled onto what was then called the information superhighway, that is the internet, that it was going to it was going to change not only my life but it was going to change the world, um, and uh, you know I got shivers down my spine uh, both times when I uh, the first time I saw an iPhone was actually in New York City I was back home on a trip and a guy came into the lobby of the hotel I was in. And I went over to him and he was so excited about his device. And I was actually showing him how to use it because I'd read everything already online about this amazing technology. Mm. Yeah, you, you talk about in the book and, you know, you you engage in some self-deprecating humor, talking about catching yourself in the in the restroom on several devices at once. And but, you know, more seriously, observing your children uh attention being grabbed constantly, uh, as we know, not just by one device or one window or one screen, but by several simultaneously at that time already while they're doing homework, uh, and things that were really concerning you, I think about their intellectual development, how they interacted with each other and their peers and with you. Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. The the impact that all of this was having on the quality or lack thereof of our relationships with one another as a family was was very striking to me. And sometime, just maybe a few months prior to actually pulling the plug, I was um, uh, you know, making radio at that time and I did a feature story about a family and I had to sort of search for them. I put a call out onto, um, you know, on live radio looking for a family that lived without television um, or I guess computers, yeah, because they certainly didn't have it. Anyway, of some family called in and I went out to the hills of Perth to investigate. They had five children and that was an amazing experience for me. They were such a delightful family and it was, uh, the kids were so curious and switched on and friendly and creative. And I thought, wow, how I wished that I had done this. Like, why wasn't I brave enough to do this at the time? Being a single mother might have had something to do with it, you know, because media are, are lifesavers uh, for all parents uh, to a degree. So it was a brave choice this woman had made, and it made me kind of ashamed of myself for not putting my money where my mouth was. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a, a short portion from the beginning of the book where you, you talk about patterns you observe with your kids, which you know, don't say anything about you, really. They're common amongst many people now. We were eating meals as a family less and less often. Uh, never, if you want to get technical about it. The gir girls were either splurge snacking or experimenting with weird diets. Uh, your son, you talk about them, you know, snacking constantly, not just mm. on food, but on media. And even when they had friends over, you say more and more their socializing took the form of little knots of spectators gathered around the cheery globe glow of YouTube, or worse, dispersed into separate corners, each to his own device. And then uh, their sleep patterns also becoming really erratic, uh, which wasn't surprising, given that they had their devices with them all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have to say that at the time, in 2009, um, certainly in Australian terms, uh, when this book came out, like it was, uh, people were amused by it. And I was a columnist for a national newspaper at the time. So like my writing was well known and people, and so was my family because I used to write about them and people were like, oh, there goes Susan again, you know, such a crazy <laughs> family. They're so out of control. And yet now, it just even interestingly, hearing that read back to me, Robert, I just think, well, that's life now, isn't it? Like that's life for every family. Yeah, that that's become that's become the norm. Let me jump ahead a little bit. I do want to 
walk through a bit how the experiment went. But since we're talking about it, uh, for your family now, uh, having having gone through it, are things di- do you find that things are different for your family now than for the, the the typical family? Did the experiment of of divorcing yourself from technology for six months stick and help you develop habits and ways of interacting with each other that have stayed around? Well, look, it was you know you you can't step in the same river twice, and there like our lives were changed immeasurably by the experiment, although there were many unanticipated um, outcomes and consequences. So one, I have to remind you that this was almost 10 years ago. So my kids who were teenagers are now all uh, adults. They're all young adults. In fact, just as of a few weeks ago, I am an empty nester. So uh, my kids don't live under my roof, although they all live within five minutes of me. So, um, uh, so, so there's that, that like this happened in our family at a critical moment when I still had everybody under the same roof and we could give this a go. So just if just a few observations about how it has stuck with us. Well, first of all, I did move back to New York, not as a direct consequence of the experiment, but yeah, it was definitely a consequence of it. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. I was like so up for experimentation, almost feeling like this had been such a rousing success for us as a family, um, for each of us individually, like all pretty much all the things that I wanted to accomplish in terms of um, improving the quality of our interactions, like deepening our bonds, getting back to, um, you know, it sounds so cliched, but getting back to actually connecting as human beings, just rediscovering hobbies of various kinds, rediscovering music, rediscovering reading, you know, the kids kind of waking up and noticing that their rooms were like, you know, pigsties and because there was nothing else to go to, you know, there was nothing else to escape to. There was no other reality to escape to. So we had to open up our eyes and see what was around us in all kinds of ways. And I went through this too. And it it was, you know, it was a learning curve. Um, The business about the family meals, how, you know, that was something that I'd always sort of tried to enforce that we would at least sit down and have a meal together at a table. But while technology was in our lives, uh, people would just, they would speed eat, you know, they would just like shovel their food down because there was always something better to get to. And when that was removed, it was quite fascinating because there was nothing better to get to. So (laughs) people just stuck around. Yeah. One of the first things that struck me that you talked about uh, was very early on in the first few days, experiencing boredom. Everyone really having to confront boredom uh, and and not having any place else quick to turn to, to escape from it. And, you you know, you said you learned a lot about boredom um, and and how to deal with it when there's no quick fix. Yeah, the value of boredom. And indeed, a couple of years ago, I did, believe it or not, a four-part radio series called Fun with Boredom (laughs) for ABC Radio because, uh, and I was, you know, very much inclined to write an entire book about it, but I read a couple of them and they were boring. So I moved on from that. (laughs) But yeah, the, the, um, you know, this fear that we have, you know, as parents and as individuals of uh, being bored, that boredom is this problem that we have to fix immediately. We have to forestall, we have to fix it before it even sets in. And that, you know, boredom busters for kids and, you know, kind of having this arsenal of pastimes and entertainments and ways of of distracting children's attention and indeed our own attention, uh, because otherwise we might fall into this horrifying pit called boredom. But, you know, sort of drilling down into the boredom literature, and there is a boredom literature, it um, very much um, uh, reinforced what we were experiencing, which was that boredom can be, uh, certain kinds of boredom can provide a creative space, uh, you know, a place for 
daydreaming and um, letting your mind wander where it will. And that is, uh, you know, that's an experience that is sort of central, not just to people who are engaged in creative endeavors, but really, I think, to the human experience. Um, that sort of reflective um, quality. I, I often refer to my need to just stare at a wall for several hours on the weekend. Um, you know, boredom has always been something that I kind of cherish. Like, I, there's nothing like a good old boring day. <laughs> and But it's, you know, it's hard to have that when you have your laptop or your iPad in your lap because you're going to be constantly you know, consuming stuff and you're going to be off on somebody else's journey, which is going to be like a, probably a really seductive, fascinating one. I'm Mm -hmm. still an information junkie, but, um, you know, there's just such value to be had in having those, you know, empty stretches. Yeah. You, you mention in the book that, uh, parents had come to the point where they felt, and still is true that they're actually responsible for, just getting rid of their kids' boredom. And you said, I'm quoting, perhaps above all, throwing technology at their children's complaints about being bored. And you you mentioned also getting some negative feedback from parents, other parents or perhaps friends or family members before you embarked on this and you told them you were going to do it. Uh, people thinking it might actually be irresponsible of you to do this for for your children. Yes, that really shocked me. Um, uh, That was something I had not anticipated. But yes, I had several people say to me, how could you do that to your children? Why would you do that to your children? Or, um, well, in our family, you see, you couldn't do that because you see our children need the internet to do their homework. And I was just, you know, I never stopped rolling my eyes. Um, you know, we, we were all allowed to use, uh, well, the, the kids were allowed to, to use computers at school um, and they were allowed to do their homework at school if they wished to on, on a laptop. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they wasn't like we were entirely cut off. It was our, it was our family home. That was the sacred space. So it seemed, it seemed so unreasonable, almost like, um, like people had been brainwashed into believing (laughs) that life could not be lived. Like kids could not live a life without the internet. I mean, that, that still blows my mind or that I would be doing them a disservice, that I would be um, disadvantaging them, when in my mind it was such a clear way of advantaging them. Let me uh, ask the question that I I hear from lots of parents, or the the claim, uh, which is that the thing that parents and their children absolutely need a, a phone for is for the, quote, emergency. And that it would be uh, uh, neglect for a parent not to have cell phone communication available between them and their child. You talk about it in the book. And so what was your answer to this and what was your solution and, and how did that play out? Okay, look, first I have to say I'm not I'm not without sympathy for that point of view. Yeah. But I also have to say it's total crap. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I get it. As a parent, I totally get it. But- um, you know, and I had my my youngest daughter, who was 14 at the time, say, oh, mom, but the school will require a cell phone from you because what if there's an emergency? And I actually called the school and spoke to the school secretary and she just laughed and said, <laughs> well, of course not. I mean, you know, a landline is perfectly fine. And when you think about what a true emergency entails, um, you know, if it's a real emergency, you're not going to have the time or the wherewithal to take out your iPhone and make a phone call often. I mean, my son did have an accident. He had a potentially serious accident on his bike uh, during the experiment. He was going downhill at high speed and hit some kind of obstruction and the bike flipped over and he landed sort of flat on his back. And um, would he have called me in that event, yes, he probably would have, but um, a, a passerby had the opportunity to be a wonderful good Samaritan. He was immediately taken into her home and given a cup of tea and driven home. And, you know, it was like, could I have done better than that? No. 
I like I couldn't have been there on the spot. It would have taken me ages to get there. So, you know, like it, I, I feel like technology does induce in us a, a false sense of urgency because it gives us that capacity for instant connection, which then in a, in a sort of weird, like uh, almost like psychological alchemy, we start to believe that because we can, in theory, connect with one another instantaneously, that we must, that, that sort of life depends, life and limb in this case, depends on us being able to do that. And that's simply a delusion. And you even mentioned that you felt that because he he was, of course, attended to and cared for, that it, it was in some way better that you found out afterwards, um, uh, because there was nothing that could have been done really by you before then. Exactly. Exactly. It would have just multiplied the anxiety. Um, uh, I wouldn't. How could I have contributed? I would have known, and I would have been upset. And if if it had been actually serious, it would have been very, very easy to find me. You know, I was at home with a landline, or if I wasn't at home with a landline, I was at work with a landline, or if, God forbid, I was on the train for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you know, there are neighbors, there's a community, there are other, you know, there are other responsible adults around. So it kind of, like, it kind of increases the burden on parents in a way, um, in a very direct way, really, to be the solely responsible person instead of kind of letting the village take a bit of responsibility as well. Yeah, it seemed to be a theme throughout the book that that this control you exercised over technology really did lead to more direct human connection. Uh, both w within the, your family, I mean, it, it sounds... It might sound a little bit corny, but I was really struck when you talked about the board games coming out. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what was really strange, Robert, was, okay, so my kids were obviously, you know, they had to do something. So, yeah, they were burrowing to the very bottom of their, their closets and toy chests from, from childhood. But what really struck me was that their friends wanted to come over and spend time in our technology-free house because it was like, uh, well, A, it was a novelty, but B, I, it was actually more fun. So it was more fun to sit around on the floor and, you know, play. They even played tiddlywinks. I mean, come on, tiddlywinks? <laughs> um, and, you know, have hot chocolate. Or we did a lot of baking because that's one thing you can do without high tech. So there was always good food. And, you know, it was it was an eye-opener for me to see kids, like, clamor to have a sleepover at our house where they couldn't watch YouTubes and they couldn't watch TV and they couldn't Skype with each other and they couldn't SMS and all that other stuff. So they, they actually, they, that others wanted to. I mean, my kids were being forced into it, but their friends weren't. So they, they were actually attracted to it. Did your kids anticipate that happening or was this something that happened organically despite whatever their anticipations were? Yeah, no, they didn't anticipate it. And I have to say, though, that there were casualties in their social group, particularly for my youngest. She had a group of girlfriends who were very, very hooked in, even at that point. You know, they, I, my first encounter with Skype was in Sussie's bedroom, um, and I was so startled. I didn't even, you know, know this was a thing and just saw, you know, her girlfriend on a screen and she was talking to her. I was like, this shows you how long ago it was. I was like, wow, right. what's going on? So some of those friends did drift away because she wasn't participating in, um, you know, in the instant message world. That was the core of their friendship. And also the kind of spontaneous get togethers that could happen because people could text each other and so on. So she was out of that loop. So she did kind of migrate to a different friendship group, which was the kind of kids who would actually plan a sleepover, <laughs> you know, <laughs> seemed, uh, you know, it was like a whole different scene. And that's another thing, planning a sleepover, like we now know that anticipation is a good part of the joy, the happiness and the gratification that we get from pleasant events. Vacations, for example. You should, you know, you should plan ahead. You should have something to look forward to. 
Um, doing things on the spur of the moment is good too, but if all of life is just kind of improvised, then you kind of, you, you miss out on that quality of joy, that anticipatory joy, which is real. I don't know if it was in your book or somewhere else I had come across the phrase, the death of anticipation, as being something that the digital age has, has brought us in part for the reasons you mentioned, and in part because people are always updating each other on everything that happens. When you <laughs> yeah. get together with a family member, there's nothing that you haven't already been updated on. <laughs> I hate that, Robert. I don't think that was my phrase, but look, I wish it were because it's something that continually annoys me. And I must say my sister is the worst offender. So like, I feel like I just, I hate talking to her because she knows everything already. And I don't even like use Facebook, but she sort of gleans it from people that I know that do. And yeah, there's, there's never any news. It's like, oh yeah, I saw that on Facebook. Oh yeah, I saw the Instagram. Oh yeah, there was a Snapchat story about it. And I was like, mm. <laughs> You know, like, can't well, what's left? Like, why don't we just like sign off now, and I'll post something to you. And it, it's interesting also that you mentioned the your children starting to actually plan. I think you mentioned that one of them had scoffed at you at the idea of of even the most basic planning to get together with a friend. You know, even an hour before that, their modus operandi was to be texting on the way to meet each other about when and where and what they would be doing. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. And my son was, uh, you know, so skeptical that he and I could manage to converge uh, at a given geographical point. Like I was, I don't know, we were picking up something and we were both coming from a different place. And he was like, how are we going to do this without phones? How are we going to do this? How are we ever going to find each other? <laughs> And it was like, well, there's this, it's called a landmark and there's a watch and you look at the time and you, you know, you're under the clock at this time. And it was like a revelation to him. He was like dumbfounded that it worked. Lost skills from an ancient civilization. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly so. But I, you know, I hate to sound like, uh, you know, Bill O'Reilly here, you know, and be, uh, you know, old school is the best school kind of thing. Um, but there are, there are certain skills that are, you know, we, we got to keep them up. And, and that's one of them. And you talk, I think, I think about yourself, I think you talked more about it with your kids, just developing the skill of being able to be focused for longer periods of time at a time and then over time. I, I'm, I'm a musician, so I was very attuned to your son. You said fishing the saxophone out of the toy closet after mm -hmm. it's sitting there for years and him seemingly becoming a pretty accomplished musician over some period of time, in part as a result of there not being the technology to turn to, and then gain, you know, growing a social a community of other friends who played instruments and sang. Am, am I right about all that? You're absolutely right. And he is a professional musician, among other things, today. So, I mean, that had a very long-lasting impact. And, you know, probably the best and the worst moment of the entire experiment for me was when Bill said something to the effect of, um, you know, maybe midway through, imagine if I had, if all the hours I had spent gaming, I had spent practicing saxophone, how good would I be now? Yeah, it was a very poignant and touching moment there. How old was he at the time? Uh, 15, I guess. Mm -hmm. 16? Yeah. Yeah, he turned 16 over the course of the experiment. But um, yeah, and Bill has had an interesting sort of, um, he's made interesting choices and that have certainly been influenced by our experience with the experiment. He spent, he spent a long time in remote locations, um, the Abrellis Islands, for example, example, which are uh, an island chain off the, like a long way off the coast of Western Australia, very remote chain of islands where very few people go. And he has spent a months at a time there uh, working on a pearl farm, a very, very limited reception. Maybe, you know, if you climb on the roof and jump up and down, 
occasionally you'll get a bit of signal and I've spent time out there with him and it's a, it's takes almost as long to get to the islands as it does to get from Perth to New York. And um, it's, you know, primitive. There's no plumbing. There's no actual land. The islands are just like heaps of coral plunked down in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Um, and Bill has thrived on that. And you might have to speculate, but he's your son. Do you do you think that no. the experiment contributed to to that in some way? I know it did. Oh. Yeah, I, I know it did. Um uh, but having said that, you know, my youngest daughter, it works in uh, digital marketing and she's an absolute fiend. You know, <laughs> she's amazing. She's, she was always the digital sort of virtuoso and she has, uh, she's kept that up and that's now her livelihood. And, um, uh, you know, and, and I have total respect for that as well too, um, she's, she's the one though, that had, that struggled the most with the experiment. Um, and it was therefore the biggest victory when she actually got with the program. Initially, she moved out to her dad's house. So just, you know, in large part to avoid having to, um, to, to give up her technology. I still, I still, uh, you know, worry that she is too connected. Um, and sometimes like you know, like on Easter, I was thinking, am I, and I discussed it with my older daughter, Ani, am I going to have to say to Sas, don't bring your phone into the dining room? Like, will I have to say that? And she was like, well, don't say that. Just let's, let's see what happens. Um, and she didn't, and I was glad, but so, you know, so I can't say, oh yes. And like now Sussy, you know, she, she leaves her phone at home. No, she's connected all the time. My and you know and again it's her livelihood. My eldest daughter Ani is uh, a journalist, and she uses the apps uh, both on her phone and on her computer that turn off the internet. You know, like uh, Freedom is one, and Moments I think is the one that she uses on her phone, and she makes regular use of those. Um, because she knows that she needs to. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. It's interesting that you mention uh, your youngest daughter as having had the most difficulty with it and giving the time of when this occurred. I hate to generalize, but have you wondered whether you, did, you conducted this experiment at sort of the last point when it could succeed <laughs> or... Uh, whether whether the next generation was going to become too hooked in in some way. Well, that's, that's interesting, Robert. That's a really interesting question. I'm tempted to say, you know, as we discussed before, that people told me that it was too late, that it couldn't, you know, like life had just moved in a direction such that it was not possible to conduct a meaningful life without technology. Um, so they said that in 2009. Um, now we say, well, it's it's very true that, you know, we are all so much more connected and so much more, um, you know, we, we inhabit a digital world to a much greater extent now. But I'm sorry, I don't think that we have passed a point in time where such an experiment is possible and would be a worthwhile and very gratifying thing to do. I mean, like who, who would do it for six months unless they were writing a book about it? I don't know, like very, probably very few people. Um, but to suggest that because the world we live in now is so much more saturated with digital media that therefore we couldn't live, um, you know, viable lives, let alone, you know, gratifying contented, satisfying lives with without that media, no, I, I reject that. It, if you were to advise a family who wanted to do this experiment now, today in 2017, what advice would you give them? Yeah, look, I mean, I have advised people to just, you know, you don't have to do six months, just do a weekend. Um, it, it, 
It, it is difficult, though, because for the benefits to begin to emerge, which make the experiment kind of like um, self-confirming for children as well as for yourself. So it takes a bit of time for those benefits to reveal themselves. So for the first couple of days, like the first couple of days of, you know, giving up anything that you really love or you think you love, you know, it can be, it can be really difficult. Or if you have like a technology free weekend, then you as the parent may find yourself in the position of being the new iPhone, you know, like you have to, <laughs> you know, you have to lay it all on, you have to provide the entertainment and you have to, you know, make it into a big special event. We're going to the circus, we're going to the beach, you know, and, and then it turns into something else entirely. So I think some thought does need to be given to, a, you know, like a critical time frame for this to happen. And I suspect a weekend, even though, look, it's better than nothing, is probably not optimal. Then again, just to have a technology-free Wednesday night might be fun. Like, you know, it doesn't have to change you for all time, but just have one night of the week where nobody, parents included, um, uses a device where, you know, you collect the phones into a cardboard box, as I used to do with my poor students at Fordham, um, who actually quite enjoyed the experience once they got over the shock. Yeah, collect the phones into a cardboard box and turn off the TV and figure out something else to do. And for people who would be afraid of this or or worry about it, what are the positive benefits? Maybe just the key ones, let's say, that you you and your family experienced that you could share to help motivate other people to try to start down this path, even for a night or a weekend or a week. It's more fun. That's like, like that's it in a nutshell. Like that's the biggest motivation I can suggest is that it's not some kind of like horrible penance that you're doing. You know, obviously, yes, you're giving up something, but the reason to do it is that it's more fun. Life, life is more fun. Your family is more fun, mm. you know, and, and you might be too. Well, that's great, Susan. Uh, to end on that note. So thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a, a great pleasure speaking to you today. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Dr. Susan Mousehart, the author of The Winter of Our Disconnect, how three totally wired teenagers and the mother who slept with her iPhone pulled the plug on their technology and lived to tell the tale. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. Please join us for our next episode, where I'll interview independent filmmaker Tiffany Schlein, the director and co-writer of films including Technology, Shabbats, and Connected, an autobiography about love, death, and technology. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Mm-hmm.